Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Rupert Reed. I'm the chair of this event, the second in our 2021 series of public lectures in philosophy here at the University of East Anglia. Thank you so much for joining us. You're joining us in an unusual way. This is the um, first time that we've run an entire series uh, online. Last year's series was already affected by the coronavirus. That's why we're here uh, online and, and this season we're doing all online events. So wherever you are, uh, welcome. And of course, that's directly connected with what we're going to be talking about here this evening. Because in our season on the upside of down, tonight the focus is on the coronavirus crisis. Let me remind you that in a couple of weeks time, the next lecture in the series will be by my colleague, Dr. Sophie Scott Brown. She will be talking about how the multiple intersecting crises that we are currently facing should inflect our education system and whether our education system is failing us in relation to those crises and in particular in relation to the climate crisis. So that should be a very provocative event, uh, very suitable to be hosted um, by a university um, such as this one. I'm going to turn now to introducing our speaker for this evening, although in the classic phrase he needs relatively little introduction. Richard Horton is the editor of The Lancet, the premier medical journal, which has played a huge role, especially uh, over the last year, but also obviously for a much longer period. And he is also uh, an author in his own right. Um, the book that may interest most of you in relation to what he's going to be talking about this evening is his book, the COVID-19 catastrophe, what's gone wrong and how to stop it happening again. What's gonna happen this evening is that Richard's going to give us a lecture for 30 to 40 minutes. I'll then ask him one or two questions. And during that time, please be thinking of the questions that you may want to ask, because we have a long period this evening for a detailed Q&A as is our practice here in these philosophy public lectures to really drill into the topic at hand. It is a huge pleasure to have Richard here. He's been a trenchant, outspoken, and of course, incredibly well-informed voice on this crisis. Here this evening, he's gonna be perhaps stepping back a little bit from the immediate fray, but the title that we've given him is Silver Linings from the National Scandal of COVID-19. Why National Scandal? Well, that is the very phrase that Richard used and made somewhat famous in describing last year what had happened in the early phase of the COVID crisis. And I just happened to see today, just before we started this lecture, that there's new data showing once again that Britain's per capita death rate from COVID appears to be just about the highest in the entire world, higher than the US, higher than Italy, and so forth. Well, that's the context, that's the title. Here's the man, Richard, over to you. We're really, really pleased to have you here with us this evening. Please um, give us, uh, if you will, your public lecture. Thank you very much indeed, Rupert. And um, it's great to be with everybody. I'm sorry that we're not meeting in person. Um, can I just emphasize that um, I'm very happy to take questions uh, across any subject to do with uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic although I'm gonna be focusing on one particular aspect um, of the response to the pandemic. And that aspect is really occasioned by the fact that we are living in the midst of what is nothing less than a spectacular scientific success story. The design, the proof of safety and efficacy, the manufacture, the distribution, um, and the dramatic impact of now multiple COVID-19 vaccines, vaccines that are going to play an absolutely decisive part in terminating the worst excesses of this pandemic. And if you'd asked me one year ago um, whether it would have been possible to be in this situation with a vaccine, I would have been extremely doubtful. Um, no successful vaccine um, has been produced uh, in such a rapid period of time. Um, and it's actually a tribute to not just a year of work, but decades of work that enabled scientists to be so agile in being able to move quickly to produce this, these vaccines. But that astonishing success 
comes after several early failures by the scientific community, uh, at least the scientific community in many Western nations. Failures to understand and respond to what I believe were very clear signals that were coming from Wuhan back in January of last year. I don't want to rehearse those failures now because Rupert very kindly mentioned um, the book and I go into those in, in the book in some detail. Um, and what, I've, what I really want to do is to step back um, and reflect on what has happened to science and the relationship between science and society over the past 12 months. What I'd like to do is to defend the proposition that there's been a radical change in the status of science um, within democracies. Uh, and that radical repositioning offers new opportunities, but also risks for our societies in the coming years. Um, it's interesting to me because COVID-19 has brought into the spotlight an issue that the science community um, has largely been indifferent to, in fact. It's an issue that philosophers of science, um, such as Philip Kitcher or Heather Douglas, um, have been preoccupied with for some time. And that is how to integrate scientific knowledge and expertise um, with democratic values. So that's really the subject of what I would like to reflect on over the next 30 minutes or so. Let me very briefly sketch out some of the changes that have contributed to what I think is this repositioning. First of all, there have been changes to the practice of science. Uh, as I mentioned, the global scientific community responded to the pandemic with the most striking pivot ever seen in the history of science. Um, the resources of the research community were redirected and intensified uh, rapidly to address COVID-19. At the Lancet, we saw the volume of submitted material um, more than double, and in some specialties, quadruple. Um, incredible, um, that response. Um, we saw clinical trials being designed um, in unprecedented, with unprecedented speed and delivering results which had a massive material impact on clinical outcomes. The recovery trial, um, a very, very important trial set up within the National Health Service, um, quickly showed that dexamethasone for the most sickest patients on intensive care could reduce mortality by a third. That same trial recently produced results that showed that a, a different drug called tocilizumab could, in addition to the lives saved by dexamethasone, save further lives. Um, these kinds of studies have really made a huge impact on the response to the pandemic. There have been changes in the communication of science. Um, all of the research around the world on COVID-19 has been made freely available, no access barriers whatsoever unprecedented transparency in the science around the pandemic, um, enabling that science to have hopefully a much more direct impact on public understanding, public policy, and certainly clinical care. Um, it's a revolution actually in scientific publishing that has the potential to transform an industry that has had over recent decades, something of a tarnished reputation. The um, Scientific response has also seen a change to, the way I put it, is the certification of science. As you know, science usually goes through a fairly laborious process of external scientific peer review, um, which can take weeks or months, uh, and then papers are edited and eventually published. Um, but what we've seen now is this emergence of a preprint culture where work uh, may be submitted to journals, but actually it's immediately posted on freely accessible databases. Um, and that work, although it hasn't been peer reviewed, hasn't gone through the usual certification process, is nevertheless treated by the media uh, as any other scientific paper. Just to give you an example, yesterday I got a call 
in the middle of the afternoon from the PM program. Um, the Lancet had put up two preprints on its preprint server, uh, looking at data of, on the efficacy of the two vaccines that we're using in the United Kingdom, some data from England, some data from Scotland. Uh, these preprints had not been externally peer reviewed, they'd not been published in the Lancet, but they, these Word documents were available. Um, and uh, I was being asked to go and comment on them as if they were papers that had gone through the usual processes that we implement. Um, it felt, to be honest, a little bit like the Wild West of publishing, um, and it does have implications about um, policing the integrity of science, but I will have some comments about that later. A fourth area that's changed dramatically is public engagement with science. Wall-to-wall -wall media coverage, too much perhaps for, for your taste, um, but radio, television, print, online media have, are absolutely saturated with uh, pandemic news. Social media has been a very, very important part of this response um, and actually has enabled a much greater um, ability to dissect the science that has been published. That's actually enhanced the engagement um, by the public with science that, and it's played a very important role, as I just mentioned, in policing the integrity of data. Now we got caught in, in this um, in a very um, striking way last year. The New England Journal of Medicine in the United States and The Lancet both published work from a group in the US um, that used a database that uh, to all intents and purposes seemed legitimate. Uh, the papers at the New England Journal and The Lancet passed peer review. Uh, we both published the papers at, at roughly the same time. Um, but then thanks to journalists at The Guardian um, combined with uh, a whole host of people on Twitter, they dissected the data at a level of detail that our peer review didn't do and found that there were inconsistencies in the data such that when we in the New England Journal went back to the authors to ask for clarification, we discovered that their work was entirely fraudulent. Um, both journals had to retract their respective papers. I don't believe that would have happened um, unless we had had that um, scaled up public engagement. And finally, there's been changes to the application of science. The, um, give you one example, the very rapid uh, deployment of genomic surveillance, the setting up of the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium in April of last year, uh, led by Sharon Peacock, which has sequenced over 200,000 genes in such a short space of time, provided us with absolutely crucial information about these new variants that are circulating. Um, in all of these aspects, um, practice, communication, certification, public engagement and application, I think we've sort of seen step changes um, in science and, and never, certainly in my time uh, over the last 30 years of working in medical science, never have I seen the norms of science changed um, so rapidly or dramatically. So one could call those changes broadly positive. Um, if you like the credit um, column of COVID-19 science, um, but there has been uh, a troubling debit column. Um, and it's one that the scientific community has been a little reluctant to acknowledge, let alone discuss. So I gave you five credits. Let me give you five debits. Um, number one, uh, there were examples of bad science and fraudulent science. I've given you an example um, that we got mixed up with and the New England Journal got mixed up with. Uh, but there have been other examples too of studies that have been either posted on preprint servers or in journals that have caused enormous controversy. Um, one very obvious example, um, preprints which eventually had to be taken down, which were alleging um, some complicated uh, form of viral engineering at the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, along the lines of the theory that somehow this was a human-made pandemic um, using a bioweapon, um, a fanciful hypothesis that has absolutely no support in any um, credible paper, but the scientific community contributed to that um, and created mechanisms to propagate that. 
A second debit, um, the scientific community has interpreted what's gone on in the past uh, 12 months as largely the threat of a virus um, and the metrics of our response to that virus um, have been very much in the classic way of um, framing of, of an infectious disease, thinking about numbers of cases of infection, hospitalizations and deaths. But what became very clear early on was that we were not just dealing with a, an epidemic, we were dealing with what one can call a syndemic, a synthesis of epidemics, the virus on a background of chronic ill health, um, and also interacting with poverty, inequality, and precarity in our communi communities. What we've seen is the biomedicalization of this pandemic, which had the knock-on effect of allowing politicians to evade their responsibilities um, for presiding over deep inequalities, um, marginalizations and social exclusions in our society um, that were one of the major driving forces of the excess mortality we've seen. A third um, debit is that part of the reason for that biomedicalization um, was, um, sorry to say, the abject failure of the public health science community to mobilize itself um, and place the pandemic in its proper societal context. Um, and to use that evidence to hold governments accountable for their response. Now that failure reached its apotheosis, its institutional apotheosis, um, with the announcement in August last year that Public Health England was going to be abolished and replaced with a new National Institute for Health Protection. It was a political decision, but it was a political decision made because Public Health England had unfortunately not stepped up to the need of the moment. And now this new institute uh, is going to be absorbing all of the public health science that uh, Public Health England was once responsible for into its remit. A fourth debit is that scientists reproduce the mistakes of politicians by failing to unite across countries to learn lessons, devise appropriate strategies, and insist on a resolutely global response to a global um, crisis. Um, one of the great strengths of science is its transnational nature, and scientists would often, and rightly so, repeat the mantra that no one is safe until all are safe, but in their own practices, they commonly behave in narrow nationalistic ways. And a final debit is that we're beginning to see now uh, an emerging critique of pandemic science itself. I'll give you one very recent example. Warwick Anderson from the University of Sydney published this month a paper in Social Studies in Medicine in which he wrote about what he called the model crisis. And he points out that in a crisis, it's a moment for judgment, for decisions, uh, and here a tipping point um, that mobilized a specific analytical approach to this pandemic, a very particular analytical approach that was foregrounded, which was using modeling science to frame and define the event. He looks back historically at the origins of model, modeling science, and he roots it in Cold War notions of risk and surveillance, containment and security. But he's critical of modeling science because it ignores the wider context of the pandemic that we've all seen, of course, cultural differences, social heterogeneities, human diversity, the distinctive structures um, in society that have shaped um, the response to the pandemic, our customs, our habits, all of which have been influential. Um, those complexities are completely lost. Um, in reductive mathematical models, um, our exclusive, almost obsessive focus on an R value. And he argues that, the, the, in his view, the truth is that a specific category of science and scientists were authorized in this pandemic to play a crucial role 
policy and political role, whereas others did not receive that authority. Now, a year into the pandemic, or the syndemic, if, if, uh, if I may say, um, there's been very little critical discussion about how the scientific community has fared, the good and the less good. Now, that may seem surprising, um, but I think there is a, there's a reason for that. And the reason for that lies in the nature of science journalism. Political journalists and commentators have been unsparing in their forensic examination of government actions, but that's not the way science journalism works. Um, I think the reason why scientists have, um, in some senses, evaded the scrutiny um, of the public gaze can be explained, at least partly, by the particular relationship between science reporters and scientists. Science journalists are what one could say, could describe as stenographers of science. They see their primary role as accurately reporting scientific findings to the general public. They don't see their role commonly um, as holding science to account in the same way that political journalists do. They tend not to question or criticize or dissent from the orthodox positions that scientists or scientific institutions would promulgate. That depoliticization of science reporting has blunted the ability of journalism to scrutinize the activity of science as an important part of our culture. And I, I think that's been um, a distinctive failing over the past 12 months. It's existed before, but it's been brought to bear um, with even greater weight um, during the pandemic. Now, there's a further matter, I think, that needs attention, and that's the relationship between scientists themselves and policymakers and political decision makers. Um, it's become a cliche to hear politicians talk about we're being guided by the science. Um, and it's, it's a standard defense and a very effective defense that politicians have deployed when they're on the back foot as the numbers of deaths have soared. But what did that phrase really mean? Um, because there's knowledge about SARS-CoV-2, the virus, and the disease it causes, COVID-19 accumulated, interpretations about the science um, differed widely. In the early months, for example, the dangers of the virus were seen as only moderate. That was the official recognition by several government committees. And that led, of course, to advice that mitigation, not suppression, was an appropriate public health strategy. Well, experience from elsewhere, notably in China in January and February, um, led other scientists to conclude exactly the opposite, that mitigation would be a disastrous response and that the only effective way to get a grip on the virus would be suppression. And that was because the virus was seen to be so transmissible and the disease it caused so fatal for a significant number of people um, that, that mitigation just was not going to be an effective response. It was clear in January last year that that was the case from the evidence that was already published in the public domain from China. The fact that our scientists in Western countries did not understand what their Chinese colleagues were telling them in these papers that were published in January was a cataclysmic error of judgment and eventually of policy making. Um, and the, it was the result of errors made initially by scientists advising the government. Of course, that there, there were political failures too. Politicians should have been asking much tougher questions, but underlying those failures, there were also errors by the scientific community. Now, once scientists and advisors understood those mistakes. We then saw something very peculiar happen. We saw them, that they made a Faustian bargain with the political class. 
in order to save, effectively to save the reputation of science in the eyes of government, because politicians were wondering what on earth had hit them and why they hadn't been warned earlier and with greater force, to save the reputation of science, what you saw was that our scientific and medical advisors joined a collusive pact with ministers expressed in those daily press conferences where you would have those same scientific and medical advisors side by side with prime minister or, or other politicians defending a government presiding over what was the most significant state failure by any standard since Suez. And we had the quite simply appalling spectacle of those advisors saying things that they knew to be untrue. That the UK, for example, was an international exemplar in pandemic, pandemic preparedness. Well, they knew full well that that wasn't the case. That testing wasn't an appropriate strategy for the UK to take. Uh, it was urgently needed. That PPE was being adequately delivered to the front line of healthcare when they knew full well that that was not true. So this exchange of independence for political protection was utterly tragic and self-defeating and has led to a serious schism in the scientific community with the creation of what's called independent sage. Independent sage, you may have heard of, it is the mirror image of the official sage. It's led by the former chief scientific advisor, Sir David King, that's held its first meeting in May of last year. It's really hard for me to overstate the importance of the fact that Independent Sage was created. I can't think of any past example, and I've been around for 30 years, as I say, um, and we've gone through many health emergencies in that time. I can't think of any past example when a group of truly mainstream scientists led by a former chief science advisor, somebody who was on the inside of government, has felt so dissatisfied with official scientific advice that they had to create their own vehicle to provide independent, what they thought of as independent scientific advice. And the work of Independent Sage has been critical, yes, but also constructive. They've analyzed the failures of NHS test and trace, which the official sage has not done to any degree. They've drawn attention to the central significance of inequality in driving poor health outcomes um, and the particular risk faced by Black, Asian, minority ethnic communities. Independent sage has proposed strategies for return to school, set out plans to tackle the virus variants, and they've been offering ideas about how to achieve global vaccine rollout. And most recently, just last week, um, published their own sustainable suppression strategy for keeping society open. I think there are several features of Independent Sage that deserve particular attention um, and are relevant for thinking about how science rebuilds some of the trust that it's lost with the public and with government. First of all, independence. Um, independent Sage doesn't answer to government, but it does share its work openly with government and with the public. And members of Independent Sage do not appear side by side government ministers to support the government. They've been very careful about protecting that independence. The second aspect, which I think is important to learn from, is their multidisciplinary membership. Yes, they do have epidemiologists and mathematical modelers as part of their membership, but they're not dominated by those mathematical modelers. They have virologists, clinicians, global health, public health experts, behavioral scientists, psychologists, and social scientists as, as part of their makeup. And they have a much more balanced um, multi or interdisciplinary um, approach to the pandemic. A third difference between independent SAGE and SAGE is its method of engagement through weekly press briefings and, and reports. Uh, they appear on YouTube, they, are, they take questions from the public, they have a level of transparency and accountability that reaches well beyond 
the official committees such as SAGE. And a final, a final aspect characteristic of independent SAGE is quite simply its worldview. Um, it has a far more capacious worldview than the official scientific advisory groups, far more willing to adopt an explicitly social lens to the pandemic, far more willing to draw on the social determinants of poor health and to apply principles of equity and social justice to their analyses and recommendations. But I think it would be wrong to see independent SAGE as simply a schism or an expression of dissatisfaction. I think actually it's nothing less than a, an act of resistance by one group of scientists against another group of scientists based on the view that existing scientific advice had become collusive with government, perhaps even corrupted by government. I'd like to turn now, if I may, to the central issue that I mentioned at the beginning about the place of science in a democracy. Now, some writers have argued that we're today living in a biocracy. Linton Keith Coldwell, for example, um, used the term biocracy in two ways. Um, first, describe the influences of life forces on human behavior, including political behavior, but also to describe the influence of the life sciences on society and public policy. Take, take one example, the emergence of particular groups of scientists as public figures in public discourse, commenting, interpreting, critiquing, and advisors, advising, we all know their names so well now. Neil Ferguson, David Stridar, David Spiegel, Holter, John Bell, Peter no Openshaw, Susan Mickey, Anthony Costello, Anne Johnson. Um, they are on almost one or other of those on most news programs taking questions or calls or advising. Certain institutions um, ha have become very powerful actors in shaping public and political understanding of the pandemic, Imperial College, uh, the London School of Hygiene, um, I should say the University of East Anglia, um, the Wellcome Trust. Um, the landscape of public discourse um, has really been redrawn in a very dramatic way. And scientists and scientific institutions um, have moved center stage like never before. Now, inevitably, these changes are news driven um, and are likely to be transitory. When the pandemic um, is finally under control, it's likely we won't be hearing from so many of those people um, as much as we do today. But I do think that the impact of this saturation media coverage and media attention of science and scientists um, uh, may have a lasting legacy. Over the past decade, uh, science has established a firm although relatively small and circumscribed foothold in a public culture. During and after COVID-19, uh, I think science may have a, play a much stronger part, be a much stronger force um, in our public discourse. If I'm right, if science does stick, so to speak, in the public's consciousness, then that's going to have implications um, for uh, the recalibration of science in the public sphere. A positive, a positive aspect of that recalibration um, is the opportunity to really campaign more effectively for the, for the right to progressively realize um, the benefits from and partic participation in science. Um, the right to science, uh, to put it um, in, in its shortest form. That right to science is expressed in Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that everyone has the right to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. It's there in Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. Importantly, last year, there was something called General Comment 25, published in April, got lost amid all the news of the pandemic, that set out the implications of the right to science. Uh, I won't take you through all those implications. Suffice it to say that it made clear that governments have obligations to progressively realize the right to science. And COVID-19, it seems to me, um, has really shown not only the important contribution 
that science can make to our culture, but also the fact that citizens really do have meaningful entitlements to the benefits of science and the participation in science when it comes to the practice of science in their societies. But if science does stick, there may also be consequences which might not be as productive for scientists and the scientific community, and they're worth considering. Let me give you just a few examples. The public has seen incredibly sharp conflicts between scientists during this pandemic. Take the Great Barrington Declaration versus the John Snow Memorandum. Focus protect, protection and anti-lockdown versus those who wanted lockdown and a su suppression um, strategy. Or take the Oxford scientists, Carl Hennigan and Tom Jefferson, who played an important part in arguing against the use of masks. Or take today at the moment, John Deeks, who's an epidemiologist in Birmingham and others who's arguing very strongly against the use of lateral flow tests because they're not reliable enough. These these conflicts are not surprising um, to scientists. They take place in the pages of scientific journals all the time. The fact that one scientist quarrels with another scientist, that's not news at all. But those conflicts have been brought into the public domain and they did seem to surprise the media and the public who perhaps thought that scientific knowledge was not quite as contested as it really was. And a further consequence of, of the fact that this um, so to speak, this um, disruptive, disputatious scientific culture has been brought into the public domain is that other, others, non-scientists, now feel perfectly free to join the struggle um, about what the science means. And we've seen um, during COVID-19, several notable non-scientists challenge the prevailing scientific consensus with very powerful impact. Jonathan Sumption, um, former High Court Justice, We've seen former Prime Minister Tony Blair make decisive interventions. Um, so the nature of public debate around science uh, is going to change, and that could be quite discomforting for scientists who normally sit in the shadows in society. Mm -hmm. Another area that we should perhaps be concerned about is that data may become a much more important part of our national conversation. Our lives have been described this past year by graphs, rates, bar charts. Now, making decisions on accurate data, I don't disagree with that. Of course, it's good practice to do that. It should be about data and not dates, as we heard yesterday. But data can convey a spurious sense of certainty about certain actions to be taken. And the line between monitoring and surveillance between a vigilant society and a disciplinary society is actually quite thin. Um, a society and its decision-making that's driven by the collection organization and judgment about data does carry risks because the values that underpin democracies can get swept aside um, and deprioritized. In addition to that, um, putting science in a more central position in our culture um, inevitably is going to bring in another elite at the decision-making table of power, a scientific elite. Now that scientific elite, let's be clear, is neither value-free or disinterested. Scientists have their own goals, their own strategies, their own objectives that they want to pursue and achieve. And to what extent those goals, strategies, and objectives are in the best interest of democratic societies? Well, those, there are questions around that. If COVID-19 strengthens the voice of one more powerful elite at the center of political influence, it's reasonable to ask if that's a, a step forward for democracy. And the last concern is that if scientists and scientific institutions do assume a greater role in public life, should we be concerned that society might be drifting from democracy to technocracy? Because sure as sure, we saw over the past 12 months that politicians did defer a significant power to scientists, despite the untruth that scientists advise and ministers decide, scientists played a very important part uh, in shaping the response that we've seen. 
Anders Esmark in his 2020 book called The New Technocracy argues that in fact the opposition between technocracy and populism in his words is now the defining political conflict of our era. We've certainly entered an era of new technopolitics and it's one that's going to continue for some years to come. Um, in a technocracy, it's assumed, I think, that the world is completely knowable. And in a technocracy, it's assumed that what is good comes from what is true. Um, but is that the society we really want to live in? Now, I'm going to, I'm going to conclude now. Um, and I'm going to conclude with a few provisional um, interpretations about our whole COVID-19 experience as it relates to science and society. Okay, so very quickly. First, um, first reflection. The extraordinary contribution, I take nothing away from the scientific community here, the extraordinary contribution that scientists have made to understanding and responding to the pandemic has relocated science from the margins of our culture to the center of our culture. And that repositioning hasn't just benefited science and attention, respect and funding, it's also benefited the public. And it's benefited the public, in my view, because scientists are now much more accountable to that public for the science they do and the applications to which it's put. Second um, reflection. There's been a lot of theoretical discussion about open science and what open science means. Theoretical advantages about discovery, engagement, collaboration, efficiency, access, and so on. COVID-19 has been an absolute watershed for open science, and it's hard to see how science can return to its previously closed ways. But that era of openness does have consequences for science. As I mentioned before, scientists have been able to practice what they do, prioritize what they do, largely in the shadows of society. In the UK, the scientific community um, has practice what's called the Haldane Principle. And the Haldane Principle is that decisions about what research money is spent on should be made by researchers alone, not politicians or the public. I think now, the, although that might be true at the individual research grant um, level, surely there is now scope for a renegotiated social contract between science and government and science and society. Because if open science truly means open science, the scientific community is going to have to cede some of its sovereignty over its control of the research agenda. The public has a right to influence, either directly or through elected representatives, the priorities of science. And that means a much richer, more vigorous public conversation than we've had before between scientists and the public about science's contribution to society. A third reflection, the existing regime of science policy making, making is utterly broken. The network of official bodies that we have in shaping science policy um, over the past 12 months, certainly in the early phase of the pandemic response, broke down completely. It's impossibly complex and it's not transparent at all. We have a chief medical officer's office, a chief science advisor's office, we have SAGE, we have NERVTAG, we have SPY-M, we have SPY-B, Spy we have COBRA, we have the creation of independent SAGE. There needs to be a complete re-evaluation of how scientific advice is formulated, by whom and with what evidence. A fourth reflection, is that the values that underpin and shape the practice and the reception and application of science need much further analysis and discussion. At the very beginning of the pandemic and until recently, the purpose of science's contribution was very clear. It was to save lives. But we know when you look at the response from other countries that saving lives was an explicit choice. It wasn't obvious that that was going to be the choice. In Sweden, for example, they didn't emphasize saving lives. They emphasized saving livelihoods. And more recently in the UK, we've moved from talking about saving lives to talking about acceptable levels of mortality, that we have to live side by side the virus, that um, we're not going to be able to save every life. Science can contribute to saving lives, but 
there's going to have to be some renegotiation of the relationship with SARS-CoV-2. So I think that the, the deference that the public and politicians have so shown to scientists was understandable during the early days of a terrifying emergency, but that deference should have been tempered and needs to be tempered by much greater transparency about the values um, of framing science. And a fifth and final observation is it seems to me that we need to call into question the very nature of the role of the scientist in society. Zaid al Hussein, who's a former United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, has asked why scientists have been so silent about some of the major questions, political questions of our time, such as questions around human rights. He asks, where are the Andrei Sakharovs of the 21st century? Why aren't scientists today more concerned about the moral, social, and political implications of their work? And I think COVID-19 provides a particular opportunity for scientists to re-examine their role and purpose as citizens in society with specific skills, responsibilities, and obligations. Right, last, last words, last comment. This COVID-19 catastrophe has conveniently been framed um, by opposition politicians, government critics as a political failure. But as I've tried to show, yes, there have been political failures, but there have also been scientific failures as well. And it's important that we in the scientific community, and I'm part of that community, it's important that we accept those responsibilities and that we consider reforms to our institutions and government, governance and practices to really try and seize the genuine opportunities the pandemic's given us to revise our relationship with society. But I think we do need to go further. Some of you may be aware of Philip Kitch's work and, and in his two, 2011 book, Science in a Democratic Society, he argues that we need to have a theory of the place of science in a democratic society. He writes, the ways in which a system of public knowledge should be shaped to promote democratic ideals. If you were ever skeptical about that claim, I think COVID-19 has proven that we urgently need that theory, that theory of science in society. I think it would be a fitting tribute if we could devise that theory, not only for the success to, not only to recognize the success of science over the past 12 months, but also to acknowledge some of science's frailties. Thank you very much and look forward to questions. Richard, thank you so much. That was that was splendid and um, both uh, excoriating in part, including with perhaps some unexpected uh, targets. And uh, obviously, we're appreciative of the of the serious level in which you included uh, philosophical, epistemological, ethical considerations in what you said. So many, many thanks. I'm going to start us off with a couple of questions here, uh, and I'd urge people in the audience to be. Um, contributing further questions to the chat um, for which we will come to quite soon. So the first thing I'd like to ask is this, Richard. So a couple of weeks ago, we had Amitav Ghosh, the novelist and, um, and uh, climate commentator here, and he made a very interesting point about coronavirus. He said, who would have expected uh, 18 months ago that if there were a huge pandemic, that among the countries in the world which would come out the absolute worst from it, would be the USA and the UK, while countries like Sierra Leone and Vietnam, and to a reasonable extent, uh, India, uh, have done actually you know, quite well um, through the pan pandemic. And he argued that um, sort of exceptionalist uh, assumptions and it's assumptions about sort of Western development and superiority in some sense of the, of the rich countries of the global North countries, that those assumptions were no longer uh, valid or or viable, um, and he suggested that that, that 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 truth might carry over to other crises, such as uh, the climate crisis. That the expectation that countries like ours are going to be fine in that crisis, compared to frontline states, as it were, like Bangladesh and India, might prove mistaken. Now, I've detected a similar theme in your book on COVID. That you think that that the COVID crisis has shown us ways in which the uh, the culture, the civilization, the systems that, uh, that we have are not all that we've taken them to be cracked up to be. 
Um, and in your work uh, and in my work, we focus a lot on uh, on that in government and politics. This evening, you've also spoken about it in very interesting ways with regard to science. Would you like to comment a little bit more on that? How do you see this crisis as having uh, undermined um, lazy, complacent assumptions, perhaps, that we make about sort of, well, we're kind of going to be okay here because we're rich and we're well organized and so on and so forth? Yeah, thank you, Rupert. Well, um... Maybe I could just first, um, I will answer your question, but also say we're still in the middle of this pandemic. And despite mm. all, the, all the rhetoric of uh, Boris Johnson yesterday, um, if I look at the latest projections, for example, for India, um, the expectation is that over the next three or four months, by June the 1st, there could be as many as another 165,000 deaths. Um, in Russia, another 300,000 deaths. In America, close to another 100,000 deaths. So, so some of the, some of the countries, um, like India, that uh, had a... I mean, they, they've already had 150,000 um, deaths, so it's a lot of deaths. Um, but it could be getting a lot worse there. And I think on Africa, um, again, let's be careful, it's still early days, and um, there could be a lot of dangers still left to go on on th that continent. Now that Absolutely. said, yeah. Now that said, I I do think that um, uh, two issues in particular um, we have to reflect on. First of all, um, we have built since the days of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan um, a neoliberal economy that has seen the intensification of the application of the market in every aspect of our life as the way to solve social problems. Um, and the just-in-time economy that we've created, the emphasis on efficiency, um, in good times that might work um, reasonably well, but it certainly has failed us here. What we needed um, to manage our way through the pandemic was resilient institutions, institutions that were able to absorb shocks, um, and we didn't have them. Uh, and, and most of the Western nations um, that have fared so badly have suffered because they didn't have resilient institutions. So that's number one. The, the neoliberal model that we've operated on, I think, really has to be questioned. Um, a second issue is certainly governance. Um, our governance failed. Um, it failed in the UK, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in the United States. It's failing in Latin America, really terrifyingly. Um, and we have to try and understand why it failed. And I don't have any simple solutions here because I, different, and this is where I think sort of modeling science doesn't help us very much. Um, there are specific political, cultural, social um, heterogeneities in countries um, which are responsible for uh, the fact that governments were not able to respond as effectively as possible. So it's not easy to transpose the lessons from the UK to any other country, for example. You know, the United States um, has a particular problem because it's effectively 50 separate countries. And if there's no federal response, then you have 50 separate responses run by governors who are politically partisan. Um, and that's a model that we it's difficult for us to learn from. Um, so. But, but the, broad, the broad heading of governance, I think, is, is, um, is, is important there. In China, um, I've, I, you know, I've been criticized for being praiseworthy of the Chinese response. Um, but I do admire what uh, Chinese doctors and scientists did there. Um, they, with a more authoritarian system, were able to shut down society um, and suppress the outbreak very, very early on. Um, and that's something that we, we didn't do um, because of our system of governance. Um, so I think those two issues for me, the political culture and the neoliberal model. Um, were mm. To follow up on that briefly, um, is there um, a broader cultural failure that can be detected in countries like the Anglo countries, especially also quite a lot of European countries, quite a lot of Latin American countries, which may have political roots. I'm thinking of uh, of more individualistic cultures versus more communitarian 
subcultures? Is there a way in which the, very crudely speaking, sort of Confucian, uh, etc., heritage uh, in the East uh, set up those countries well in relation to this uh, pandemic? Look at the use of masks, for example. I've noticed for years in this country the way that when, um, when foreign students from the Far East um, are ill when they have a cold or something, they will, they will put on a mask. Uh, mm. as a sort of spontaneous act of kind of social solidarity. That doesn't come very naturally to us here in the UK. Mm. Have we suffered in countries like these because our, our culture, um, partly influenced by our politics, has a kind of individualistic hue, which makes us very ill-equipped for these kinds of uh, mega crises? That's very interesting. Um... I've always put it down to, in trying to understand the East Asian exceptionalism in the response, I've put it down to a different factor, and that is the events of 20 years ago with the first SARS outbreak. Um, yeah. You know, um, China was humiliated in, on the world stage uh, in 2002 03, uh, when it was called out by Gru Harlan Brundtland, the then WHO Director General, for lying to the world about what was going on in China. And uh, they swore that they would never allow that humiliation to happen again. Um, and I think that the, I think in, in East Asian countries, they realized that they dodged the bullet. It, they, there was a real near miss situation there. Um, and so whenever there's been an outbreak since, the first thing they think of is SARS. And they have a very low threshold for all of these um, social distancing, wearing mask interventions that we've got so used to now. Um, whereas we didn't see it that way. We, we, you know, SARS didn't mean anything to us. Um, and we saw everything through the lens of influenza. So I think that's, that to me was the reason why there's that difference. Because, so, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right about the mask wearing, but if you go to Japan or China, people do wear masks. Um, on the street in, in ordinary circumstances, um, when there's, you know, not, not in a pandemic, but just as part of ordinary social mixing, um, because there's a much higher level of awareness of respiratory pathogens. And I think, you know, I think this is what's going to happen um, here, uh, that, that we're going to go into winters every year, and you're go it's now going to be acceptable, um, maybe actually, um, the norm, the new norm, to wear masks and people won't feel weird about it like we would have done 12 months ago. Mm. One more question from me and then we'll throw it open to the floor. So do be ready with your questions, folks. We've got some good ones building up in the chat. I was fascinated by your remarks about technocracy, which seemed to me uh, very acute. Um, and your remark, for example, that in a technocracy, there's a danger that people will make the assumption that they know, uh, that they basically know what the, what the risks are and how to handle them. In the early stages of the, of the pandemic in 2020, my colleagues uh, Nassim Talib and Yanir Bayam and myself, we argued that um, a precautionary response should be made um, to the emerging pandemic at a very low threshold of evidence that before we really knew what was going on, uh, we were saying things like people should just start wearing masks and uh, countries should just start bringing in quarantine policies and there should be a radical reduction um, uh, in air travel. And of course, some countries more or less practiced uh, that at the nation level as well, the, the classic example being uh, New Zealand. Do you see um, this kind of precautionary reasoning as something that scientists should um, either avail themselves of more or explicitly think of as a complement to what they do. If there'd been more of that, um, presumably the kinds of failings that we saw in the UK scientific establishment in early 2020 would have been much less likely. Yes, this is a, I mean, we could talk about this question actually for hours. This is a, this, let, I, let me approach it this way. The situation with masks was, um, was a very good example of how the science changed over the course of the pandemic. So rewind back to January, February time. And remember we had, we were, you know, disinfecting, you know, we were all carrying hand gel around and disinfecting our shopping bags and scrubbing mm. surfaces because we thought that the virus was on door handles and everywhere. 
And then by about the summer, um, and these were studies that were done again in, um, in, in China, um, people realized that actually the big problem was aerosols. The, the, it was the aerosol spread of the virus. And so in the early phase, we, we had people say, well, you don't need to wear masks, masks are irrelevant. Um, and then by the time June came, everybody thought, oh my God, that was completely the wrong thing to have said because actually masks are the very thing that can really save lives. But by then it was it, it, somehow, I mean, you know, if you read Peter Hitchens in the Mail on Sunday, which I don't encourage you to do on a regular basis, but just for the purposes of academic investigation, it's worth it. Um, you know, you, you then have masks becoming this totemic issue um, of our liberty. And the right not to wear a mask became emblematic of liberties that our forefathers and mothers had died for over centuries. I mean, it was the most unbelievable trope that, 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 de that developed. So, you know, yes, I mean, it would be great if we could, um, uh, if we could have had a more precautionary stance. But I think the reason why we didn't was that there was a genuine um, misunderstanding about the nature of transmission, number one. And number two, we then got caught up in this, and this is a cultural um, debate with it actually, we got caught up in this libertarian um, discussion um, where people were talking of calling them face nappies and the, the idea that you would wear a mask was the government trying to silence you because it was covering your mouth. I mean, it, it, it got crazy. But these, these arguments are still ongoing, um, at least in certain, in certain newspapers. Yeah, great. Uh, over to um, the questions which we have building up. The first question is going to come from Alison Teal. Alison, can I ask you to unmute yourself because I was fascinated by your question. I'd like to uh, like to invite you to ask it directly. Alison's question is about um, science uh, and how what you've been saying, Richard, could be related to the uh, broader uh, climate crisis. Alison, are you there? Can you go ahead? Uh, yes, thanks, Rupert. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation, Richard. That was really fascinating. Um, I was interested if perhaps both of you can comment on the degree to which the, the pandemic has been driven by the climate and ecological emergency and those factors driving that, but also and related to that. Um, now scientists have, have got a higher profile. Will this enhance the potential for a more scientifically driven public dis discourse? around the climate and, sorry, <laughs> climate and ecological emergency. Thank you. Mm. Mm, Thanks, thank Alison. You. Richard, you go first on that. Well, it's a really great question. And um, the UK has a potentially very important part to play in this this year because we are hosting COP26 in November in Glasgow. Um, and that's gonna be a major moment. Um, for us to demonstrate leadership in, in, in climate science. Now, the issue about the link with COVID-19, well, most definitely, um, as, as you will know, um, SARS-CoV-2 is what's called a zoonosis. That's to say it jumped from one animal to another animal, us. Um, um, we don't fully yet know um, the, uh, which animal it jumped from to. Um, it might, there might be an intermediary host. Uh, you remember the Wuhan market. Um, it's probable, it's possible, I should say, that the original source is uh, a bat um, because it has some similarities to other SARS viruses or other coronaviruses that come that, that are in bats. Um, the point is that the disruption that our species has made to the ecosystems in which we uh, live has meant that the risk of viruses jumping from one species to another has gone up dramatically. And over the last 40 years, there have been um, about 10 or 12 zoonotic infections that have happened. You know them, SARS, uh, Ebola, MERS, um, and there are others. Um, and the reason why we are discovering these is because we are damaging our ecosystem so much. So um, in, in, uh, just to mention, there's a, you, you will know him better than I do, but Slavoj Žižek, 
um, it, he's talked about in his latest book, um, the fact that we should be seeing this um, pandemic as the fusion of three issues, a virus, ecosystem collapse, and racism. And the, our interpretation of the pandemic, it's elaborating on the point that I was trying to make um, in my few words, if we see this pandemic as only being about a virus, we will make catastrophic mistakes in understanding the nature of what's happened to us and in future protecting us from further pandemics. It is partly about a virus, but it is not exclusively about a virus. Um, and unfortunately, I don't see enough scientists or policymakers or politicians saying that it's crucial to get that frame of reference right. Mm. And uh, I'll just add to that uh, briefly two thoughts. One, that there is an increasing um, number of papers coming out that suggest that um, dangerous climate change and global overheat um, are massively probabilifying um, the emergence of such uh, uh, novel zoonotic uh, virus viruses because they're basically forcing animals to move um, and uh, the second point I'd like to add is the extremely obvious point, but you don't hear it very often in the media, um, that the virus was, uh, was carted around the world at the speed of jet planes rather than at the speed of steamships as with the Spanish flu. And that added uh, catastrophically to its speed of travel, which is one of the key reasons why those countries which reigned in travel quickly have tended to do well. Uh, and why countries that didn't, such as the UK, have tended to do badly. And this is, of course, very relevant now still when we're dealing with these new, uh, with these new variants, um, which, uh, you know, when we're talking about the South African variant, for example, uh, could be extremely worrying. And those countries that managed to, to keep it out um, could be at a great, uh, uh, great advantage. So uh, the way I sum this up is jet planes are the real super spreaders. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Alison, thank, thank you so much for that question. Yeah. Um, can we go now to Richard Lawson? And, and Richard, if you're there, can you unmute yourself and ask uh, your question? Richard, I think you're a doctor and you want to ask something slightly um, specific to Richard. Yes, um, yes it is. I'm a retired GP. I've been struggling for the last five months um, to get a very simple piece of technology um, adopted. And it looks to me as if the respiratory medicine is missing an open goal. Of the patients in hospital with COVID, between 15 and 30% um, have caught the disease in hospital. Um, and as we now know, since the summer, this is the, most of the transmission is from aerosols. Mm. PPE is an only a partial barrier. And we do have a technology which will... Uh, substantially reduced by 90, about 90%, 95%, um, the aerosols coming from a patient simply by capturing and sequestering the virus using very, very simple technology. And it's a real struggle to try to get this um, to be uh, acknowledged and taken up in the NHS. There are 80 units of these, they're called the, the uh, Melbourne Isolation Hood, or you just Google Medihood, um, you will find that there's 80 in Australia where they're invented. There is one unit um, in a West Country hospital. So I hope that um, we will be able to, there will be more knowledge about this possibility in future. Mm. Well, thank you very much. I'm looking it up now, the Medihood on, uh, on a, on a well-known search engine near you. Um, and uh, I will... I will investigate further. Of course, what we're hoping is that another technology is going to help us in health settings, and that is the vaccine. Um, because uh, one of the preprint papers that we published yesterday was looking, from Public Health England, uh, was looking at the efficacy of the vaccine in health workers. They looked at over 20,000 health workers across 100 hospitals in England. And they found that uh, this was with the Pfizer vaccine. With two doses of the Pfizer vaccine, you could get 86% um, protection. So um, I don't know about the Medihood, but what I would do is I would, I would strongly urge all my colleagues in healthcare to make sure that they have the, 
uh, they get the vaccine because it will make a massive contribution in, to reducing transmission of infection and protecting you in the hospital setting. It won't, it, it, won't it won't rule out the fact that we have to have some PPE and social distancing completely, but 86% is uh, impressive. Great, thanks Richard. And Lisa yeah. asks this, do you think the proliferation of medical preprints like MedArchive, M-E-D-R-X-I-V, has helped or hindered COVID research? And I, I think Lisa is attending that in the context of your remarks about preprints earlier, where you seemed to say, look, there's something really positive here, but there's also something dangerous because then the media sort of sees upon them and so forth. So how, how exactly are we to, to think this one through? How does it pan out in the round? Yeah, well, let me give, let me give you an example. Um, so uh, the way it works with the preprint, the authors literally upload it themselves. Um, and they're not meant to, they're meant to be no access barriers whatsoever. Um, it's, it's, this work hasn't been peer reviewed. We usually do have an editor who casts a very quick eye over the paper to make sure that it's not complete nonsense. Um, but we have a very low threshold for allowing things to be posted. Um, and then if the paper is of interest to us, we will then get it properly peer reviewed and uh, it will be published in a, a Lancet journal. Now I woke up the other Sunday morning to hear David Davis being interviewed on some news program um, in which he mentioned a Lancet preprint about vitamin D. And I had not a clue what he was talking about. Um, I didn't know about Lancet preprint. Um, you know, thousands get posted every week and I can't see every single one of them. Um, and so I thought, my God, what was that? And he was saying that this preprint proved that everybody should be taking vitamin D, which seemed a very strong claim. Um, so I scurried off and uh, we investigated what this was all about. And this paper was absolute nonsense. Um, it wasn't a proper trial. It claimed to be something that it wasn't. Um, the data um, definitely didn't look uh, reliable. Um, and so we took it down on Monday um, because we thought actually it was potentially dangerous. So, you know, on the one hand, what we've seen is that, um, and, and we've seen this with the recovery trial, uh, which produced all this work on dexamethasone and tocilizumab, when they, when they got the result on dexamethasone, rather than waiting um, days or weeks for a journal to publish it, they immediately posted it on MedArchive. Um, which was great because you could see that this really good group in Oxford, the fantastic clinical trial, you could see the result. And literally that day, intensive care staff could give dexamethasone and cut mortality by 30%. Wow, that's massive. And that was thanks to a preprint. But the downside is I wake up and hear about some nonsense study on our preprint server that if people go out and take vitamin D, well, it's not going to kill you, but it isn't going to help you um, in the way that's claimed. So I, you know, I'm basically torn between these two positions. I can't give you a definitive answer. I can see the benefits and it saves lives if you can get that kind of work out immediately. But I can also see the dangers. Um, so right now, this is why I say it's the Wild West of science, yeah. because there are no rules, no rules at all. Mm. So it's, it's a little frightening. Yeah, got it. Just specifically on vitamin D, uh, Richard, um, isn't there quite a lot of independent evidence that vitamin D does give you some uh, level of protection? There, there have been these epidemiological studies, right, that suggest that, uh, that there's this very high correlation between uh, vitamin D deficiency and and uh, high likelihood of COVID uh, serious symptoms or death. So there is some evidence that correlates vitamin D with some outcomes. Um, it's not very consistent evidence and you get into this situation, is it correlation or causation? Um, and so what you really do need is a randomized trial where some get it and some don't and you measure a, an outcome and that just hasn't been done. So we are, we're, we're struggling to know that, you know, the threshold of evidence at the moment isn't there to say that um, people should take vitamin D. There are other good reasons for taking vitamin D in the UK. Most people in the United Kingdom have low vitamin D levels because um, we don't get much sun. And if you went and had your vitamin D level tested, Rupert, I bet it would be low 
Um, and so there are very sound reasons for us taking um, a vitamin D pill. Well, I, I take quite a lot of vitamin D supplements, especially yeah. uh, since COVID started. Right, uh, okay. Well, I mean, it basically, won't, it won't my do you any harm. Yeah, exactly. My argument would be a precautionary one that yeah, uh, yeah. it looks like there's uh, there's some reason to think it could help and it won't do harm. So why not do mm. it? Mm. Um, all right. Next question comes from James. James asks, why do you think, Richard, that social care, which ex which has experienced a single most significant amount of deaths was such an afterthought? Yes. Um, well, because I'm afraid um, we we talk about a national health service, but those of us who had anything to do with the national health service know that it's not a national health service. It's, um, we have a very fragmented structure in the way we think about care and social care has never been part of the national health service. It's not seen as, um, although the word care is there, it's not seen as core to what the NHS provides. Um, and I'm afraid that, uh, first of all, there's, a, there's a, um, uh, an out of sight, out of mind problem that unless you work in elderly care, um, most doctors don't think about social care as part of their responsibility. Um, it's just not wired into your DNA. You don't understand how the system works. It's a quite a complicated system. And only those who work with older people people in the population and their health problems really understand how, how, that, how that works. But I think the other reason in this particular case is that Simon Stevens sent a letter in the um, early part of last year when they finally realized that uh, this avalanche of COVID-19 was going to descend upon the NHS. Um, and they, they literally just instructed hospitals to discharge 30,000 odd older people from hospital to clear the beds. And that instruction um, then, of course, seeded um, care homes with SARS-CoV-2 and, and just led to that appalling high level of mortality. That's not a unique situation to the UK. Um, it happened in several other European countries. Belgium has one of the um, highest uh, mortality rates and they did something very similar. Um, uh, in Spain, something very similar happened there. So this is, I think what, this is the governance problem. Nothing was done for, for too long. Then suddenly people realized there was a crisis and then they literally had to clear patients out of the hospital and it was the older patients who had more chronic illness who suffered. Um, but it, going forward in the future, this is where we need to build in resilience to our National Health Service, the capacity to absorb a shock, and we need to integrate social care with the NHS properly. Um, and we've been sitting on this social care issue now for decades and no, gov no government's been willing to embrace it. But now I think you know, the toll of death was such that that's not going to be it's not going to be possible to uh, ignore it any longer yeah that sounds right um just to follow up on the the specific point you made about the simon stevens letter do you think that that was a catastrophic miscalculation I and mean, how was that able to happen was there not foresight about the risks that this posed to care homes is it possible that part of what was happening is that there was a, an attempt by the nhs which which uh, simon runs and perhaps also by the government to sort of uh, preserve the nhs um, at the potential cost of other parts of our system well, I think what, so remember what was happening then, we were flying blind in terms of our decision making. Remember, we had no test or trace system at the time. Mm. So we had no clue um, how prevalent the virus was anywhere in our society, in hospitals, in care homes, in the community. Not a clue. We just didn't, we didn't have the data. So we suddenly realized that what's going on in Italy um, is going to cause an absolute crisis. Um, those data are presented actually to government around March the 5th by Neil Ferguson. Um, uh, Boris Johnson doesn't do anything till March the 23rd. Well, he does incremental things, but not the full lockdown until March the 23rd. Um, during that time, they are clearing out the NHS to make way for um, 
for this uh, influx of patients. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a very hard situation, and I guess they were trying to avoid the literal overwhelm of the system that they encountered in Italy. Yeah, I mean, I think when Simon wrote that letter, he he didn't know that there was so much SARS-CoV-2 in the hospitals that patients were then going to be discharged from. He didn't have that data. Yeah. So he couldn't, in, in one sense, I sympathize with him because he was trying to protect an NHS that wasn't going to be able to cope. And since he didn't have the data, he didn't, you know, what was he to do? Nothing, assuming that there was a lot of virus in the hospitals and he couldn't seed it into care home. It is a really, I mean, this is why we needed the testing system. Yeah. Over the past 20 years, we've taken over a billion pounds out of public health. Um, so we've, we've protected ring-fenced NHS budgets, but raided public health budgets, basically destroyed the public health system in this country, so that there was no testing capacity. Mm, but th yeah. so, and that's been government after government over the last 20 years, that has yeah. especially over the last decade. Jean McNeil has uh, a very interesting, um, relevant question to the vaccine question. Jean, are, the, are you there? Can you ask your question live? Um, yeah, thanks, Rupert. I, I think you can hear me. I'm unmuted. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks, Richard. It's been a fascinating talk. So my question is, is I guess it's a, a bit about where we go from here and in the principle that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. What do you think the scientific community uh, can do? Anyone can do, I guess, who's not a government actor um, to ensure vaccine parity um, so that low income countries are uh, made, uh, vaccines are made available because at the moment we're aware that there's a, a huge disparity. There's even, you could say, a kind of vaccine nationalism yeah. um, aspect to, to the distribution globally of vaccines. Yeah, there is. There is indeed um, vaccine nationalism. And um, there is a facility, it's called COVAX, that's organized by Gavi and WHO and a group called CEPI, um, which is um, all about deploying um, paying for and deploying vaccine to those countries that are the least able to get it. But, but right now we, we have, you know, that there are um, four or five challenges that the vaccine program faces. First of all, it's great that we've got all these vaccines, but there is a problem of scale. Um, if everybody has to have two doses of the vaccine and there's seven and a half billion people on the planet, that's 15 billion doses of vaccine. That's a lot of vaccine you've got to get to people if you're going, if you're aiming to vaccinate the whole world. Um, we don't need to do that to get, if we, if we don't get subsumed by more variants, we need to get to 75, 80% um, coverage, but that's still a lot of people. Um, and so there's number one is production of the vaccine and distribution of the vaccine and manufacture of the vaccine. Um, then you've, you've got, it's got to be affordable. And the prices of the vaccine are very different. Um, the Moderna vaccine is something like over $60 per dose, whereas the Oxford vaccine is just a few dollars per dose. So some, some companies that are producing vaccines do see this, this as a profit-making opportunity, whereas others clearly don't. So there's a cost issue. Then there's an allocation issue. Who gets the vaccine? Um, and at the moment, we are seeing China and Russia use uh, the vaccine as part of its kind of foreign policy of influence. Um, COVAX hasn't got off the ground as rapidly as we would have liked. Um, and we are seeing other countries um, do bilat make bilateral deals um, in, in a very nationalistic foreign policy way. And then the final part is you've got to deploy the vaccine in countries, and that's not always easy. Um, some countries don't have good systems where you can get the vaccine out to communities. And the last part is hesitancy. Um, you know, there are some countries where as, as few as 50% of people say they will accept a vaccine. Um, and 50% is just too few. You know, as I say, if you want to get to herd immunity, you've got to get up to 75% and 50% uh, isn't gonna do it. So the, the whole vaccine program has got a huge number of challenges. Um, and it's really not about the medicine, it's really about the management of the program. And there is no global management plan 
for the vaccine program. WHO can't do it and isn't doing it. Um, so it's basically chaos. So, you know, anybody who's booking holidays for after June, because you think that June the 21st is going to be when everything's going to open up and it's all going to be wonderful for the summer, please reconsider because um, the world is not going to be ready for you yet. Just on the herd immunity percentage question, Richard, um, with, if the so-called Kent variant, i.e. the UK variant, takes over the world, in order to be safe, wouldn't we need something more like uh, 80% for, for herd immunity? And um, doesn't this also therefore throw into stark relief how um, those, the minority who are refusing to take the vaccine are potentially putting the, the health, not just of themselves, but of everybody, um, at risk because the longer the, the pandemic continues, the more likelihood that there is, of course, of further variants developing. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a little formula for calculating uh, herd immunity. It's one minus one over R0. So if you know what R0 is, so that's the number of secondary infections in a susceptible population from a primary infection. So if you have a more transmissible virus, that means that R0 is higher. The Kent variant has a higher R0, therefore one minus one over a higher number means that you, it's, 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 uh, you're going to need a higher number of people, higher proportion of people to be vaccinated. With vaccines, then they're not 100% effective, they're say 90% effective or 85% effective, um, then the number of people you need to immunize um, to get to herd immunity rises even more. So you're absolutely right. I think the figure for the Kent variant, I worked out to be somewhere between 75 and 80%. It does depend upon which vaccine and the vaccine efficacy as well. So, um, uh, and, and, and there are slight variations around what the R0 is. But yes, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty high number. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, we do, I mean, it, I haven't always agreed with everything Matt Hancock has said during this pandemic, but this morning on the Today programme where he said it is up to all of us, um, we do have to have a shared sense of solidarity here. Yes. You know, this is, this is about, um, you know, Rupert, your health matters to my health and my health matters to your health. And I have yeah. an, I owe you and everybody on this call a responsibility to take my health seriously and make sure that I'm immune. Um, um, so we have to, we, we really have to live that solid, that sense of solidarity. Yes, and that takes us back to the earlier discussion about um, perhaps communitarian values as against liberal individualist or libertarian mm -hmm. values and how societies which are dominated by the latter, such as uh, perhaps the USA, um, are going to really, really struggle to get through this pandemic, which of course means that unless we uh, do a lot of quarantining, et cetera, so are we all. And I, you're right. And you know, one of my worries is that this, because we've Im implemented this physical distancing, we are all now actually quite wary of one another. I mean, if I go out shopping, um, you know, people will, you know, step aside from me as if I've got the plague um, and I'm anxious about getting too close to other people. In fact, I was walking up the hill the other day and somebody was walking towards me and they got a stick that they had um, tied to their body that was a metre long with a little red ribbon on the end of the stick. So that as I was walking past her, I couldn't, if I walked more than closer than one meter I would have hit the stick so she was putting this one meter distance and I mean imagine if we all walked around with sticks sticking out of our bodies so that people couldn't get closer this is not helping our sense of solidarity <laughs> but my experience is that my experience is that by and large there has been a lot of solidarity so for example um, I go for a jog or a walk almost every day around my local uh, cemetery which is a very kind of wonderful wild space mostly and so do a lot of other people and what I find is often happening is people uh, we're moving towards each other and then we deliberately sort of step aside a bit and often we smile at each other and often that the eyes meet and it yeah. seems to me that, that actually that's there's a wonderful way in which the the social distancing actually typically involves a kind of social coming together as well. Yes London isn't Norfolk. <laughs> Yes, you may be right there. Maybe you're nicer people up in, uh, <laughs> up in Norfolk. <laughs>
The next question, I'm going to invite Lorenzo Milano to unmute himself, if you're there, Lorenzo. Lorenzo has a very interesting question about philosophy of science uh, and again, connecting with the ecological emergency. Lorenzo, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, we can. And I think you're coming to us from a long way away, which is, which is great. <laughs> thank you for joining us here this evening. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, from Italy. <laughs> and I mean, my question is this. Uh, thanks, first of all, for this interesting talk. And I was thinking about the ecological crisis, climate change, etc. And I was wondering whether this recalibration of science you were talking about might trigger changes in the scientific community, which can prove deep enough to, to be, I mean, truly decisive in this kind of context, which seem to be a very difficult context as well. And my, my worry is that scientists maybe are not uh, ready and willing enough to lose this aura of impartiality that contributes to the authority of science, at least in the eyes of the public? Yes, that's, um, it's a great question because, and, and we struggle with this actually um, at The Lancet, because we get into trouble sometimes because people say that we're too political. Um, and I never understood that, you know, if you go back to the beginning of the Enlightenment, um, if you go back, the, the example that always hits me is uh, if you go back to Diderot's encyclopedia and you read the introduction by D'Alembert, um, he explains, well, why did they put together this wretched encyclopedia in the first place? You know, it wasn't to get tenure um, and it wasn't, it wasn't to get a publication. The purpose of bringing all knowledge together in one place was to trigger social progress. Um, and somehow over the last 300 years, science has kind of got so caught up with itself um, in the industrial production of knowledge um, that the metrics by which science is judged, money, papers, and so on, um, it's kind of lost the purpose of what it was originally created for, which was to be a force for social good. Um, so this is where I say when um, Zayd al Hussein says, where are the Andrei Sakharovs of the 21st century? I think, you know, scientists are sitting in their labs, often doing great science, but they have totally disengaged from some of the, um, some of the major questions of our, of our time and feel reluctant to step out and, um, and get engaged in those more political debates. Now, the climate crisis is a, is a very good example where um, many of our scientists and scientific institutions have been quite reluctant to politically engage over this um, because they don't see that as their role. Um, so I, I do hope that COVID-19 can trigger, in a sense, the moral conscience of science um, to engage more. But I fear that there is a real um, reluctance among scientists that people, many scientists do genuinely believe that they should be apolitical and it is not their responsibility to engage in these debates. I think that's a mistake, um, but it's a very widely held view. Do you think, Richard, that um, the increasing clarity around the sense in which the COVID pandemic is to a very significant extent, at least initially, the product of um, the ecological emergency and of um, uh, and of uh, human caused climate change. Do you think that 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 sense in which one might say that COVID is part of those those crises, not leaving aside your sense, which I thought was wonderfully put, in which it's actually a syndemic rather than a pandemic. Mm. Do you think that might help change this situation that you and Lorenzo are talking about there? Do you think that may bring more um, scientists and indeed medics to, to recognize that we've got a sort of joined up um, set of crises here in which it's it becomes more and more difficult to retain this sort of political neutrality? I'm hopeful, Rupert. Um, you know, somebody I admire a great deal um, is Michael Marmot. Um, and Michael uh, has spent, you know, 50 or 60 years um, working on inequalities in health and uh, social determinants of health. And in the last 10 years in particular, he's really worked to translate 
um, his career of research into policy and political practice. And he produced a report um, just a few just a few months ago, actually, um, called Build Back Fairer, um, which was all about, as we're building back, it's not about building back better, it really is building a, a fairer society. And he set out what we need to do to build that fairer society. And, it, and it's not actually, health isn't the most important thing by any means. It really is engaging with issues such as intergenerational equity, education, poverty, fuller employment, um, stronger social protections in a very, very uh, precarious gig economy, um, a much broader package of policies, which are about pandemic preparedness, actually. But it's, it's, it's this point about not thinking just of the, of the virus. Now, you know, Michael um, is a very distinguished um, person, Sir Michael Marmot, um, and, uh, but he's seen the importance of engaging at a much more political level. And I hope that through his example, um, a new generation of scientists, epidemiologists, public health scientists, will take his lead um, and, and uh, walk in his footsteps because he's really been a fantastic moral crusader um, yeah. for this work. Absolutely, yeah. Next question comes from Elizabeth. Elizabeth asks, could you, Richard, expand more on your thoughts on the role of science, of science journalists in providing informed critique on science on top of what is already provided by peer review? Yes, so, um, we, first of all, um, science journalists play an absolutely crucial part in translating often difficult to read scientific papers into important messages for the wider public. Um, and there's a, you know, the quality of science journalism is really important. And the quality um, in the UK science journalism over the last 20 years or so has, has really, really improved. Um, so this is, a, this is a good thing. We can't, we don't want to have misunderstanding about um, science, whether it's about, uh, whatever it's about, a drug, a vaccine, or whatever. We, we need to make sure that information is accurately reported. But there is a, the difficulty is that um, I think science journalists do see themselves to some extent as almost coextensive with the scientific community. Um, they depend so much on the scientific community for their stories. Um, they depend upon access to the scientific community. Um, oftentimes, science journalists are scientists themselves who've turned to journalism. Um, and so they don't approach science with a skeptical attitude um, in the sense that the first thing they want to do is to question or critique. Um, the primary role that they believe they have is simply to report accurately. Um, and that does create, I think, a situation where you know, science is part of mainstream culture. Um, we should be questioning it, and it's a, a lot of money is spent on it. We should be questioning it. Um, so when the Wellcome Trust spends a certain amount of money on a certain issue, um, they should be held accountable for that. If they're spending it on X, why aren't they spending it on Y? Um, the same with National Institute of Health Research or the Medical Research Council hold these institutions accountable. It's public money. Um, that public money uh, shapes our lives. And the public sh has a stake in that. So journalists should be questioning that. The same with journals. And, and we do get questioned, to be fair, by, by some journalists about what we do. But yes, we should be held accountable for what we decide to publish or what we don't decide to publish. But I think it's perhaps harsh to say it's collusive, but it sometimes feels a little too friendly. The relationship between journalists and scientists is a little too friendly um, and not skeptical enough. And institutions have been created to try and broker better relationships between scientists and journalists, often for good reasons, like the Science Media Center was created so that um, journalists more accurately reported science. Well, that's a good outcome. The downside of that is that, that the relationship between those same journalists and scientists 
um, just becomes a little too um, a little too close. So I I would like to have a more critical science journalism. Um, and, and I do think that if, if science does become more mainstream in our pub, public culture, inevitably, um, we will have a more critical media, I think. Um, but it might not come from the science journalists, it may come from the political journalists. Yeah, I guess one thing I was wondering was whether it might also come from uh, universities, uh, in the sense that um, as a philosopher of science myself, and we have historians of science and sociologists of science and so on, is it possible that uh, these voices could um, question the sometimes scientific attitude, the attitude of sort of science worship, which yeah. sometimes characterizes um, some science journalism and some media coverage of science? It seems that that coverage of, of, of science in the media sort of swings between abject incomprehension and, and mm -hmm. opposition or manipulation on the one hand to a sort of um, uncritical veneration on the other. And it would be wonderful if, um, if um, academics from diverse disciplines might be able to enrich the, the ecosystem here, as it were. Do you think that may be possible? Well, I, would, I, I must say that um, I would love to see, I do think the academic community um, is one of the great untapped resources of uh, countries. Um, you know, the knowledge that resides in the academic community is, is far too hidden from public view. And so anything we can do to incentivize people working in the academy to engage in public fora, whether it's columns or news articles, whatever it is, then I think that's something to be, to be very strongly welcomed. We see that, interestingly, um, in some areas. We see a lot of historians writing in the, in, in the general media. We don't see many um, critics of science writing in, in the general media, mm. partly for the reasons you, you say that it's you know, often very adulatory. Um, but I would very, you know, we don't have a strong in community, do we, in, in this country of public intellectuals? We, we, yeah. kind of, we kind of frown on the notion of an intellectual in Britain. Um, and as, as somehow it's something a little pretentious, not very British. Um, only the French do intellectuals. <laughs> um, and that's very sad, it seems to me, because I really do think that there's, a, there's a, um, an expertise in the academy that could be brought to bear in our public dialogue. Yeah, yeah. We have a question from Adam. Do you think that the most likely source of the pandemic, a wet market, and its tie to wildlife farming and wildlife trade is underplayed? Yes, ecosystem intrusion and a warming climate might well increase zoonosis, but eating animals is surely the biggest driver, but almost never mentioned. Uh, so um, I think what we know about the Wuhan market is that we definitely know that some of the very first people who got COVID-19 had um, were in, the, in this Wuhan wet market. Not all of them though. So it's not the only locus of the virus. So it wasn't the sort of um, patient one moment, um, the Wuhan market. Um, as I mentioned, we don't know where the virus originally came from. Um, we do know, because this is work that's been done over several decades, we do know that there are bat colonies um, around that area uh, where there are coronaviruses endemic in those bat colonies. Um, your specific question about meat eating, um, of, of course, that's, a, that's tied up very much with the whole climate crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is a, a really interesting question, that um, if, we're, if we're going to change the trajectory that we have over the course of this century, it's not just about stopping flying. Um, or, or cutting fossil fuels. It's about a whole scale change in our way of life. And cutting down on the amount of meat we eat is, uh, is absolutely foundational to that change. Now, a couple of years ago, we published a commission, um, uh, which is a substantial piece of work that's, that's taken a couple of years to put together, surveying all the evidence on diet and health and the climate crisis specifically. Um, and the message of that was that we needed to have a radical change in our diet. We called it a planetary health diet and essentially substitute protein from 
uh, animals and to use plant, much more plant-based protein. Um, uh, the difficulty here is, of course, you come up against the vested interests. And one of the most uh, vociferous vested interests is the National Farmers Union. Um, and we've been making this case about cutting meat consumption now for about 20 years. Um, but every time we do so, you, you, you do see these vested interests jump up and they are very, very, it's a very powerful lobby. But I fully agree with you that um, and, unless we radically change our diets, um, then we're not going to have a full range of potential responses to the climate emergency. This might be our last question because it sort of continues from that and, uh, and um, it's, it's quite a big, big picture question, really. It's from Tash. Tash says this, it strikes many of us that the plans to tackle the climate crisis are insufficient and we are missing the crucial moment of the tipping point. I feel very concerned about my child's future and impending climate disasters. However, given the diffusion of responsibility and the sense of powerlessness individually, people I speak to feel stumped about what we can do. What potential can you see and what responsibility do scientists have to speak up and prevent denial and complacency at such a crucial moment? Right, well, Tash, um, don't feel that you are powerless. Uh, I, I learned this actually um, through bitter experience with with this work we've done over the last um, 10 or 15 years on climate and health. About 10 years ago, we published our first, one of our first commissions and we said that climate change, as we called it then, was the greatest threat to global health. And that, of course, when you say something's a threat, it does make you feel um, depressed and that there's not a lot you can do about it. And then about five years ago, we published another piece of work on climate and health. And we said that actually climate change is the biggest opportunity for global health in the 21st century. And if you see it as an opportunity, um, then you can feel much greater agency to be able to do something about it. So simply changing the food that you eat on your plate every day is, is, your, is a, an important contribution to addressing one of the crucial factors that is driving the climate emergency. If you cut down the amount of meat you eat, to take that example again, to well below 100 grams a week. So, you know, it's not saying you don't, you have to cut meat out of your diet completely, but having a steak is something you do once a month as a treat rather than something you do um, every week. Um, and shifting to plant-based protein, that is, you, you are taking control of your contribution. And then it's, then it's getting your friends to do the same and it's promulgating that message in your family. Um, so there are things that we can do um, that will make a big difference. Um, and I do think actually, I, I mean, I can tell you at the, at, the, at the Lancet, you know, the fact that none of us have, been, have traveled for the past 12 months has not only been a good thing in itself, it's totally changed the norms for the future. So we're now talking about what are we going to do in the next uh, 12 to 24 months um, if we can start flying again? Well, we're, none of us are going to be flying like we were. So people are talking about what is it going to be? We, we cut the travel budget by 30 percent, by 50 percent, by 70 percent. We don't need to do this anymore because we're going to all meet like this now. Now, I hope that we don't stop meeting face to face you know, completely. I want to be able to do a bit of travel. but. I think we're going to set a totally new norm about how we interact with each other. And that's going to have enormous co-benefits for our health, our well-being, and our planetary sustainability. So I'm actually quite optimistic, Tash, about what we can do. Mm. So there's an opportunity there for a very real uh, COVID uh, dividend, as it were, for, for the climate. And and whether that happens or not is going to depend on what government does and on what we do to government. And it's also going to depend on what institutions do. So, for example, uh, it's not just the Lancet. Obviously, uh, a university like this one needs to be rethinking its its travel policies, its travel funding and so on and so forth. And so on for, you know, for every business and every organization and every individual. So in that sense, that's something that uh, that everybody can get uh, involved in. But can I can I press you just a little bit on this question of of what scientists can contribute? Richard, mm. um, take uh, James Hansen, 
the the great uh, NASA mm. scientist who really first brought um, the 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 catastrophic potential threat from climate to public attention uh, in the mid to late uh, 1980s. And in recent years, uh, he's um, uh, taken up legal cases uh, and he's got himself arrested on more than one occasion, engaging in nonviolent uh, direct action. Do you see that as something which uh, we might hope that more scientists will be doing soon, that medics might be doing? Is it the kind of thing even that, uh, dare I say it, you might be doing? Well, there's a great tradition actually at the Lancet that the founder of the Lancet, Thomas Wackley, used to get himself regularly arrested and put in prison for uh, um, haranguing the medical establishment. I haven't got myself arrested yet, but there's always the opportunity. To be very fair to my um, medical colleagues, um, they've been incredibly active in organizations such as Extinction Rebellion, um, or uh, there's an organization called MedAct. Um, really mobilized around these wider social and political issues, including climate, including migration, um, and so on. So there, um, it's not that there isn't a group, groups that are doing this. It's just that what you don't see are some of the most senior, powerful leaders of our profession or, the, or in the scientific community doing this. And the reason for that, and I, and I hate to say this, actually, because it, it sounds so silly as a reason but there really is a there's a corruption that takes place at the heart of medicine and medical science as people go through their careers because it's seen that the most the most important um, mark or measure of um, success is to get a knighthood or a damehood and we have this honors system which is corrupting because what it does is you get to a certain point in your career and you don't want to rock the boat because you want that little committee to nominate you and, and you get your gong. And it's so corrosive, this. And it's, it's only people, there, there are a few people who are able to break that. Michael Marmot is one of them. But there's an awful lot of people who don't speak out because they either want it or they've got it and they want their seat at the table um, and they want to be part of that club. And, and that, I've, that sadly neuters and compromises the, um, the sharpness of criticism from the medical and scientific communities. And that's very, that's very disappointing. Mm -hmm. Richard, thank you so much okay. for your time this evening. You've given okay. us an absolutely splendid uh, overview. You've dived into it in detail. You've given us a very real sense of some of the silver linings that there may be from COVID. You've also given excoriating criticism where that was where that was due. I think we've had a splendid discussion. Let me remind people that there will be a video becoming available of this event. Um, look out for that. That will probably appear in about 10 days time. Uh, let, me, let me remind you that there's already a video of the Amitav Ghosh event that you'll be seeing the link to again in a minute. Let me remind you finally that in two weeks time, we'll have our own uh, Sophie Scott Brown uh, joining us and uh, Sophie will giving us, be giving us a lecture which really sort of follows on from this one uh, about uh, climate and other crises in the context of the educational uh, system. Uh, and uh, let me finish by saying thank you so much as always to tech support. Thank you to everyone from, for coming and thank you very much to, uh, to Richard. Uh, if we're able to unmute people now, maybe we could unmute people and we can get a round of applause. Uh, if that's not possible, then people can do the little applause symbol uh, on you. their on their screen uh, now, if they wish to, to do so. So Thank I'm going to I'm going to applaud. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.